And we are live. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And while today is a virtual field trip, this session is a virtual field trip, I do want to note that all February long, we are highlighting incredible women in science. We kick out all the men and spend the entire month bringing over 45 sessions from 20 different countries with incredible women from around Canada, the US, and across the globe. So thank you guys for being a part of our very special festivities. Right now, we've got five classes joining us from across uh, North America. So I'm going to give them a chance to say hi before we dive in. We've got Miss Holden's grade threes in Spruce Grove in Alberta. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome in. So nice to have you guys back. We've got Miss Hearn Smith's grade three fours in Stratford, Ontario. <laughs> Your mic sounds like you're a mouse down a well. I love it. All right. <laughs> We've got Miss Watson's grade threes in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Let me just pull up their thing. Hi, guys. Hey, A for awesome in Miss Watson's class. We've got Miss uh, Atkins grade threes in Virginia Beach, also in Virginia, in the same school down the hall with another class joining them. Hi, guys. Hello. Welcome in. Hey, and last but not least for now, with two more possibly expected, we've got Miss Olson's grade ones joining us all the way in Honolulu, Hawaii. Lucky them. Uh, their mic won't be mute, but we're going to wave at them and say hi, and they're absolutely hey, hi. Hey. hey, welcome in. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Norfolk, Virginia, by the team at the Virginia Zoo. And so they are going to walk us through marvelous mammals today. So we're mammals. Uh, and for various reasons, and we're going to learn a little bit about what makes a mammal a mammal today. But we're going to explore with some very, very cool animals today. So we've got armadillo and the sloth. Uh, for some of you who are joining on YouTube, you will have seen our sloth presentation a mere hour and a bit ago. So welcome back if that's the case. But we love sharing the Virginia Zoo's programs and amazing animals with you guys. We've done over 20 sessions of them. So for all of you who are joining for the first time, you're in for a real treat. And uh, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Brianne. And take it away. Thanks, everybody. My name is Brianne, and I'm one of the keepers here at the Virginia Zoo. Um, I help with the program animals, which are the animals that are trained to be animal ambassadors. And an animal ambassador is just an animal that's trained to go up close and personal with people. Um, the animals that we brought today, of course, are an armadillo and a sloth. And we're going to talk about these mammals. And they're both from South America and how they're actually related. And that's kind of unlikely because they're pretty different. So the first animal that I'm gonna show you today is an armadillo. <clears throat> this is Diego. He's a screaming hairy armadillo. Um, and you might wonder why he's called a screaming hairy armadillo, right? Um, well, first of all, he does have some hairs on the back of his back here. This uh, outer shell, as it were, is called a carapace. And many people don't know that armadillos, not all armadillos can actually roll up into a ball to protect themselves. There's only a couple species of armadillo that can do it. The most famous is the three-banded armadillo. They fit together like a little puzzle. Um, but other armadillos are not able to actually roll up into a ball all the way. Um, and that's where he got the other part of his name, a screaming hairy armadillo. So this species, when they feel threatened, they actually scream or let out a, a shrill sound. And they think they do that to try to scare their predators when they're in trouble. And hopefully they'll scare them enough to be able to get away, distract them enough to be able to get away. Now, Diego here, he's two years old. Um, he's gonna be three this spring and he has a twin sister. Her name is Dora, Dora and Diego. Um, and it's really common when screaming hairy armadillos have babies that they have two at a time and one is usually a male and one is usually a female. Not always, but a lot of times that is the case. Now, armadillos, they're from a part of South America where it's kind of dry, um, unlike the sloth, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. It's a lot drier where they live and they are known for burrowing in the ground. So they live on the ground and you can see his feet. He's got these claws on his feet, all four of his feet. His front feet are really good for digging and his back feet have some too but they dig burrows in the ground and they have multiple little burrows where they live. So in their home range, they may have multiple burrows where they can sleep um, and do all of their resting. They, uh, they kind of switch up how they live. And what I, what I mean by that is in the summertime, they're nocturnal. 
And what that means is they come out during the nighttime to do their hunting. And in the wintertime, when it's a little bit nicer to be outside, they sometimes come out during the day and during the night. So they might kind of change up the way that they live. Now, what do they eat, right? When they come out for their hunting, I said, what do they eat? So these guys are omnivores. Omnivore just means that they eat plants and animals. And they eat lots of plant material. Um, they may find any vegetables or something if something like that is growing nearby, but otherwise it's just going to be plant material. But they also really like to eat bugs and worms and beetles and moths and things like that. Um, here at the Virginia Zoo, we feed them a kibble that's specifically for insectivores. Um, it's just like a kibble that you would feed your dog or your cat, except it's really, really small and it's formulated specifically for them to eat. Um, now, Diego here, he's a little bit of a special case, and that's just because he has a medical condition. It's a big word. It's called mega esophagus. And what that means is that he's just not able to get the food from his mouth to his stomach without a little bit of help, without a little bit of help. The esophagus is the tube that connects your mouth, uh, the opening of your mouth to your stomach. His doesn't work right. So he ends up throwing up his food if, um, if we just feed it to him and then put him down. But because he has that condition, what we do is we feed him all soft food. And then after we feed him, we have to hold him upright for about 10 minutes before we can put him back in his habitat. And the way that we do that is we feed him upright and then we wrap him in a baby blanket. We hold him just like this and he likes a nice little pat on the bottom and he goes right to sleep for about 10 minutes. And then we put him back in his habitat. None of us hate it. It's, it's a tough job, guys. Let me tell you, it's a tough job, but um, he loves it. Um, and uh, he's spoiled because of it, but none of us mind. Um, I'm gonna put Diego here in a dig box that I have up front. And that way he can uh, dig around in the sand if he would like to. And we're gonna move on to our next animal while he has some fun in the sand. <laughs> Don't we all want a dig box in life? <laughs> all right, guys, moving right along. This is a cousin of the armadillo, one of their closest living relatives. And that's kind of weird because they are very, very different. Like I said, armadillos live on the ground, but sloths are arboreal. And that's just a word that means that they live in trees pretty much all the time. Um, they are able to come down onto the ground, but they can't stand upright like you or me. They have to crawl on the ground and they kind of crawl on their forearms down to their elbows and they swing their hips out really weird and they just have to kind of crawl along just like this if they want to move along the ground. Um, but for the most part, they live in the trees otherwise. Now, if you or I tried to hang upside down like this for as long as they can, we would get tired way before they do. And that's because they have specialized ligaments in their limbs and that's just specialized body parts in their forearms and, their, and in their legs that lock into place so that when they hang upside down, they don't have to really use much energy when they do that. Now, these guys are also native to South America and Central America, but whereas armadillos live in more dry areas, these guys live in the rainforest where it's really wet and humid, right? It rains a lot in the rainforest. And because they're so slow, sloths are known for being really slow, right? So the best method of defense against your predators when you're really slow is camouflage. So when it's really humid in your environment, which it is there, they actually use that humidity and algae will grow on their fur. And that algae helps keep them camouflaged from their predators. So when they are living in the trees, there's algae growing on the trees that they live in and then there's algae growing on their body. So they pretty much blend right into the trees that they live in. And their predators are things like harpy eagles, which are really big birds, um, jaguars and ocelots, which are big cats that can climb trees. They have very good eyesight, um, but they don't have great sense of smell. So they can't necessarily smell if there's a sloth up in the tree, but they would be able to see a sloth in the tree. But if they can't see the sloth, because the sloth is so well camouflaged, then they might walk right on by and not see that sloth at all. So their best method of defense is gonna be camouflage. And because they're so slow and they stay still for such long periods of time, they're really good at what they do. Um, now, you may know, um, we're gonna, we talk about poop a lot as zookeepers. 
sometimes, right? We, we talk about poop a lot, we clean up a lot of poop. Sloths, they have a really slow metabolism. And that just means how long it takes for you to process food. So humans, we only take about anywhere from 12 to 36 hours to process our food. Sloths can take up to one month to process their food, but usually they take about a week or so to process it. And they actually climb down from their tree about once every four to seven days to go poop on the floor in the rainforest. And then they climb all the way back up. Now they're really vulnerable to their predators when they're on the ground. So scientists don't really know why they do that. But their best guess right now is because if they poofed right where they were hanging, it might hit a bunch of leaves all the way down. And then their predators might be able to hear that. And then if they go see what was that noise, they smell the poop on the ground and then they're gonna look up and say, there's a sloth in that tree. I'm gonna go get that sloth. So that's their best guess at this point. Casey is a 23 year old two-toed sloth. And you may know that there are two-toed sloths and there are three-toed sloths. And Casey I've mentioned is a two-toed sloth. The difference is actually in their front limbs. All sloths have three toes on their back limbs. So if you look real close, you can see that Casey has three toes on her back feet here. And she only has two toes up here on her front limbs. Now, scientists are starting to think that maybe we should have called them two-fingered and three-fingered sloths because the difference is up front. So she is a two-toed or a two-fingered sloth. Um, she's been here at the Virginia Zoo for a little over two years, um, and she will be turning 24 this spring. Um, Casey very much likes her vegetables over her fruit. Um, I should mention that they are vegetarians for the most part. They're going to be eating all of the leaves and leafy greens, shoots and berries, vegetables, fruits, lots of things growing in the rainforest where they live. Um, now their diet varies depending on the species, just depending on where they live in the rainforest. So they may eat a variety of things, but they really only eat what lives around them because they don't go very far to look for food. So they're going to get the food that's really close to them. Um, when sloths have babies, they have a baby when they're hanging upside down, just like she is right now. Um, they usually only have one baby when they have one. And that baby will live with mom for a few months. And then it's time to go be your own sloth um, after you're about nine months old. So Sometimes mom will actually leave the, the territory that they live in so that the baby can have that territory. And then mom goes to find her own new territory, but she usually doesn't go very far. These guys, along with their cousins, the armadillos, they pretty much like to live solitarily most of their lives. Um, they may live in the same tree, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're living together. That just might mean that that's my section of the tree, this is your section of the tree, that's your section of the tree, but they really just like to live by themselves. Um, Casey, like I said, she likes her vegetables more than she likes her fruit. She can be a picky eater sometimes. Um, Mary Beth here has been feeding her and uh, sometimes she can be really picky. Um, she sometimes, uh, because they have a really good sense of smell, she can tell what's in our treat pouches that we have. And a lot of times she will take what she wants and I have seen her take something out of her mouth and hand it back to a trainer when she does not want what you give her. A lot of times because she can smell what you have, um, she's like, nope, I know you have a carrot in there or I know you have a sweet potato in there. I don't want that apple yet. I don't want that pear yet. But when all of her favorites are gone, then she's usually like, all right, I'll eat that pear now. I'll eat that apple now. So um, she looks like she's eating pretty well here today, but um, she can be pretty picky. It's pretty funny to watch her eat. Um, I think I will turn it over to questions yeah. and um, we'll go from there so we can learn what you guys, or we can talk about what you guys want to learn about sloths and armadillos. Fantastic. Well, Brianne and the, and the team behind, thank you guys so, so much for uh, sharing a fantastic presentation. I've also learned that my new lifelong dream is to hold a screaming herring armadillo because that was looked amazing. Um, so in addition to our live classes, we've got a bunch of YouTube groups. And for any teacher watching on YouTube, you can type in questions in the chat bar, and please do. But I really want to highlight Ms. Gertzen's class, grade fours in Bueller, Kansas, who have joined us for all four of our sessions today, which has never happened. So we really appreciate them tuning in. All right, with that said, let's start with Ms. Holden's class. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, come on up. Oh, uh, say that one more time, sorry. How many? 
armadillos can curl up in a ball. Yeah. How many kinds? How many kinds how of armadillos? Yeah. How many armadillos can curl up into a ball? I believe there are only two species that can do it. Um, we have three banded armadillos here at the zoo and they fit together just like a little puzzle piece. Um, when they curl all the way up into a ball, their head fits in just so that their tail fits in right next to it and they can completely close that carapace so that all that is left is that armor on the outside. And that's really what they use for protection against their predators. Fantastic. All right, Ms. Hearn Smith's class, if you guys have one, come on up. Oh, you were, you did, there you go, perfect. Oh yeah, you guys have the, so your guys' mic is still a little bit wonky where it makes you really, really high pitch. So type in a question, we'll see if we can fix that. Um, but type it in in the chat bar on the bottom of your screen, a little oval with three dots, and we'll see if we can get you guys to have a question. Sorry for the trouble. Um, while you're doing that, we'll go to Ms. Watson's group. If you guys have one, come on up. Hello, hi. 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 <laughs> All right, we have a question. Come on, stand up. We're a little foggy. He's going to come up. Hi. 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 Hi.
um, but I honestly don't know if they are the biggest or um, how much they would weigh. But if our six banded say she weighs about 10 pounds, 12 pounds, something like that, they probably weigh closer 15 and upwards of 15 pounds if I had to guess, um, but I'm not exactly sure. That's totally fine. This actually came up in another session we did recently. So giant armadillos, which are the biggest, um, can be over three and a half feet long and weigh up to 70 pounds. They're by far the biggest. They're gigantic. They look really freaky. They're fantastic. So I'll send pictures of those to the classes later too. They're awesome. Um, great questions. Let's go back to Ms. Atkins' class. If that student or another one in the class wants to come up and ask, go for it. He's coming, sorry. Yeah. Oh, take your time, no hurry. <laughs> A little bit close to the. There you go. Yeah. Um, how long can armadillos live? Yeah. How long can they live? Is that the question? Yep. Um, again, sorry, was that the question? Yes, that is the question. Um, again, it probably depends on the species. Um, so the screaming harries like Diego can live about 15 years on average. Um, and I'm honestly not sure what the other lifespans are. Uh, three bandits, probably about as long, maybe upwards of 20 years. Um, and a lot of times with armadillos and with any animal that some of them live in the wild and some of them live in human care, a lot of times what happens is that they have a shorter lifespan when they live in the wild. So whereas Diego may make it to be 15 here at the zoo, in the wild, they may only live to be somewhere between like five and nine years old. And that's just because in the wild, it's a tough life out there, right? They're not getting veterinary care. They're not getting a solid meal maybe every day. They have to go hunt for their food. Um, they might get attacked by a predator and wounded, and then they don't have anybody to fix that. So it's just, and you know, humans are sometimes a problem for animals in the wild as well. So typically um, their lifespans are shortened when they're in the wild. And when they're in human care and they have access to all of that veterinary care and solid meals and cares, care by their zookeepers and their educators and their caretakers every day, um, they tend to live quite a bit longer in human care. Yeah. Well, and I mean, if you have someone hand feeding you all day long, it's like the best life in the world. Um, in fact, there's been a bunch of questions about that. What, um, what, uh, what are we feeding the sloth right now? What's going on? What are on? we feeding the sloth right now? So um, it looks like Christine might have a piece of a, an apple right now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So we have a commissary on site. And what that means is we just have special keepers who uh, make all of our diets for us every day. So I don't necessarily make her diet every day. Sometimes it's a surprise what we get every day. So today it looks like she's got some carrot, maybe some sweet potato, apple. A lot of times she will have pear. She likes, uh, she gets leafy greens, lettuce um, in her diet daily usually. Um, and you can see she's smelling that apple but she's not really into it. So she said, no, thank you. And she knows that Christine has that piece of sweet potato. Casey's pretty funny. She, um, when you feed Casey, you hold up a piece of food to her nose and her mouth. And if she wants it, she'll open her mouth and let you put it in. And if she doesn't want it, she, she'll probably just leave her mouth closed. Um, if she decides to take it, but then changes her mind, like I said, she might give it back. She might drop it on the floor or she might just hold it in her mouth for several minutes and think about it. Think about whether or not she wants to eat that. Um, she's, uh, she's pretty funny, but sloths have a really good sense of smell. Like I said, that's their best sense. That's what they rely on most heavily. Um, they can see, but not very well. Their pupils are like little tiny dots, uh, little tiny, like the size of a, the head of a pen, a writing pen, little teeny tiny dots. They probably can't see more than about four and a half feet in front of them. So they definitely rely most heavily on that sense of smell. And you might see her nose just constantly working this whole time throughout the session because she can smell the food that both Mary Beth and Christine have been giving her. Outstanding, thanks ladies. All right, uh, let's head back to Ms. Holden's class. If you guys have a question, go on up. What are the baby sloths called? What are baby sloths called? I have no idea. I think they're just, I, I, really, up. I thought they were just called baby sloths, <laughs> yeah. but I could be very wrong. <laughs> yeah. There's, um, no, there's uh, nothing online that says they have any cool names, but we should come up with yeah. one at the end of the session. Wait, okay. hang on one second. I think I might have some help. Hang on one second. Uh, I got some help. Oh, 
They're called cubs, you guys, <laughs> like a bear, right? A bear cub, they're called sloth cubs. Fantastic, I love the question. Yeah. All right, uh, Ms. Gertzen's class on YouTube wanted to ask, uh, what's the most interesting thing you have seen at work in all your time as a, as a zookeeper? Oh my gosh. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah, on the spot. The most interesting thing I've ever seen Oh man, if you guys have stories, feel free to jump in. This might take me a minute. <laughs> the most interesting thing I've seen. Um, Treating rhino scratches and hunting them is natural um, healing. Oh, Mary Beth just said treating scratches on a rhino with honey because it's a healing agent for, scratch, for the scratches. Now, do we recommend um, that for kids in classes or not? <laughs> <laughs> no. Don't smear yourselves in honey at the end of the session. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Mom, Great. mom, and <laughs> um, let's see. Man, I uh, don't worry too much. We can come back if you think of it. Okay, yeah, let's come back oh, to that question. Perfect. That one. Um, I okay, let's go to Miss Hearn Smith's class. Oh, yeah, uh, Miss Hearn Smith's class still having the mic issue, so they typed in the question. How long does it take the sloth to climb up and down the tree? How long does it take a sloth to climb up and down a tree? Um, it might take all day, depending on how far up that tree they are. Um, and when I say all day, I don't mean a full 24 hours. But um, so sloths, they thought used to sleep a lot longer than they actually do, right? Um, so, but it would probably take, I don't know, depending on how far up they are, um, it could take half, you know, half of a 24 hour day to get up and down. Um, and depending on how fast they want to move too, but they don't usually move much faster than, I think it's like 0.15 miles per hour or something like that. Um, it's very, very, very slow. Um, I don't know. I've never read any studies or anything about how long it normally takes, but they go very slow just because they don't want to get spotted. So the slower they go, the better, because when they're sedentary, they can't be seen. And again, that's when they're the most vulnerable. So they're not gonna move at their top speed, even though their top speed is not very fast. Um, they're not gonna move at their top speed to do it just because they wanna make sure that they're being very stealthy and quiet um, and they take a lot of time to get down and then back up again. Fantastic. That actually answers a question we had from Ms. Kretermacher's class on YouTube as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to pass along a question from a, a student at Lansdowne Middle School, also in Virginia Beach. Um, they wanted to know, do sloths have strong arms and legs to support themselves when they're hanging? Yeah, um, so they, uh, they don't necessarily have really strong muscles or anything to be able to hang that long, but they have specialized ligaments in their limbs. And that's just parts of your body that are inside here that can lock into place on them. Our ligaments don't lock into place, but they have ligaments that can lock into place so that when together and hang from trees like that they can lock those ligaments into place and then they can pretty much lay there or hang there for hours without really using much energy at all whereas if we tried to hang from some bars like that we would probably be tired just after a few minutes because we don't have that same adaptation that they have in our session with the rescue ranch earlier in costa rica it, they mentioned that sloths have actually been found dead hanging like their ligaments and their claws are so adept at keeping on that you find them when they've actually passed away so uh that's i'm really glad we got that question yeah that's exactly right hunters used to try to get them and then they wouldn't fall so hunters <laughs> kind of stopped hunting them after they learned that they weren't going to get their prize which is great because we might have lost these guys in the wild a long time ago if that had continued we are happy to have sloths well um, Miss Atkins, oh, Miss Watson's class. I'm going to come to Miss Watson's group first. If you guys want to come up, go for it. Through the fog. <laughs> okay. Through the fog, we're here. All right, go ahead, Jay. That's your question. Wow. I was asking, how do you guys tame the rhino to put honey on it? How, how do you, do you tame the rhino to get the honey on it? Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's a good question. Um, I don't work with rhinos, um, but we do all positive reinforcement training here at the zoo. And what that means is that these animals never hear the word no. They never hear bad, wrong, time out, go to your crate. They're never punished ever by us. So what that means now, do you think they uh, are good and act really nicely all the time? No way, right? No way. So when we do pos with positive reinforcement training, we reward the good behavior that we want to see. Mm -hmm. And we ignore the behavior that we don't ever want to see again. 
Um, it's a method of training that is known to take longer than other methods of training, but it's known to be one of the most successful methods of training once the animal gets the idea. Um, it also means that it's entirely the animal's choice on whether to participate or not, which is really important because if they don't want to participate, they don't have to, and they're not going to be told that they're bad or wrong, right? They can just go on about their day. Um, they will get their rewards later because we don't withhold food either. Um, we, they're going to get their whole diet at the end of the day, no matter what, no matter if they don't do anything that we wanted all day long. So if I had to guess to answer your question, with positive reinforcement training, they've probably trained those rhinos to stand really still. Um, I have also worked as a zookeeper at Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, and we work with Clydesdales there. There are horses that weigh almost 1,700 pounds, and you can't make a horse that big just do whatever you want it to do, right? But with positive reinforcement training, we actually trained them. One of their behaviors is to stand perfectly still so that our veterinarians can go around and check their bodies and touch them all over. That's another thing that they've learned to do. They'll pick up their feet when we ask them to so we can look at them. And I would imagine with the rhinos, they've probably trained those rhinos to do similar things so that they can treat their bodies and manipulate and touch them whenever they need to. Yeah, fantastic. We've actually, uh, with uh, Ripley's Aquarium in Toronto, we've shown some of the behind the scenes working with animals to get them to do various things. Um, so we love that sort of story uh, when we can share it with zoos and aquariums. So thank you for that. Um, all right, I'm going to take two YouTube questions and then we'll go back to Miss Atkins' class to wrap us up. So Miss Kretermacher's class, Lincoln wanted to ask how small baby sloths are when they're born. Oh gosh. Um, they're not very big. I can't remember exactly how big they are. Um, I think they only weigh like not quite a pound. It's like maybe half a pound to three quarters of a pound. Um, and they are born with their claws, with their claws on their feet. And that's because they're gonna need to hang on to mom as soon as they're born. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere between about a half pound and three quarters of a pound or so when they're born. Nice, very cool. And of All course right. that's gonna depend on the, the species as well. Some sloth species are smaller than others. So like a pygmy three-toed sloth, they're pretty small to begin with, so their babies are going to be even smaller than that. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Uh, all right, uh, Tayden in Miss Gertson's class wanted to know what a kid should do if they want to have your job when they grow up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So um, most zookeepers have uh, four-year degrees, either in um, biology, animal science, um, zoology, uh, but a lot of us also have bachelors in psychology because the principles of psychology have a lot to do with positive reinforcement training. Um, not everybody has a four-year degree. Not all facilities require that. Um, so I would say almost as equally as important as getting an education is going to be volunteering, interning, getting your foot in the door somewhere, um, whether it's at a, vet, a veterinarian clinic, um, any local zoo, aquarium, um, we have the Virginia Living Museum locally, things like that, um, that you can get your foot in the door and volunteer, uh, find internships that you, can, that you can do as well, but animal experience um, and them knowing that you're willing to do it for free because um, they really want you to know that it's not all about petting the fuzzy animals all day. Um, we get to do a little bit of that, but the majority of the job is really hard work. It's a lot of cleaning. We talked about poop earlier, right? There's a lot of poop, um, a lot of poop cleanup as a zookeeper. So they, a lot of facilities want to know that you're willing to do the hard work um, and that you know what you're in for. Um, so I would just say getting experience under your belt with animals um, as well as uh, an education. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brienne. All right, we're going to wrap up with one last question from Ms. I oh. Okay, uh, Miss Atkins class, if you guys want to come up and wrap us up, come on up. Where am I learning? What line? Good question. All right, so come up here to the camera. Right there. Hi. Hi. How tiny are baby sloths? Yeah. <laughs> so show us if you could. If you have any idea, I know we've got that question from our class before, but um, for two toads, I would say they're probably, if I had to guess, I don't know, something like. Yeah, an iPhone. <laughs> little, yeah, they might be a little smaller. They might be a little bigger. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, I've never personally worked with a baby sloth, um, but I, like I said, they're about half a pound to about three quarters of a pound at birth. Amazing. 
And to wrap us up, so again, we could have questions all day about sloths, armadillos, and all the work you guys do there. Where can we send classes to learn more about the Virginia Zoo and what you guys are up to and, and encourage them to explore on their own? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, I'm just asking, where can we send kids? Where can we guide them so that they can learn more about the Virginia Zoo and all you guys are doing there? Gotcha. So the best place to go is probably going to be to our website. Um, it's virginiazoo.org. And you can learn all about um, everything that we're doing. Amazing. So I'll pass it along to our classes later, as well as their Twitter uh, handles. You can check out what they're doing there. Uh, and so thank you so, so much, guys. What we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute every class's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys can get ready to join me and saying a huge thank you to Brienne and the team, you are all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love the enthusiasm, guys. Thank you so, so much for joining us today for all our classes. Uh, Brianne, that was marvelous. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun.